Okay. Um, that's so very kind of you, sir, uh, um, Deshpande, sir, for the um, introduction, for your very warm words of introduction. Uh, in fact, uh, you are uh, an inspiration for all of us. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of the National Center for Science Communicators and so also uh, the Vidya uh, Prasarak Mandal Thane uh, and the venue, uh, Parashuram College of Engineering, uh, Walneshwar. Um, I'm rather sorry that uh, I was not able to uh, come there physically, uh, although I really wanted to be there physically to, to be a part of this. Um, I would, um, I'd just like to share my screen. Please do let me know if it is, uh, if you are able to see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So another interesting thing is uh, Deshpande sir, as usual, you know, he gave a, um, some kind of a caution to me that uh, all of you have just had a wonderful uh, happy lunch with uh, maybe five or six jamuns. Um, I don't mind uh, that. I know all of you must be feeling very sleepy as well. So I will try and uh, make it uh, not very serious. You know, the talk is not very serious. Um, the conference title is uh, Role of Science Communica Role of Communication in enhancing public engagement with uh, science and technology. Uh, a lot of lectures, uh, speakers have talked about the significance of science communication uh, in the modern society, more particularly in uh, developing countries like India. We had some wonderful uh, lectures. I was able to listen to a couple of them. Unfortunately, not all of them. So what I will do is, uh, in this uh, world of science communication, uh, the science museum also have had their own um, contribution in connecting people with science and how did this uh, science museum movement start globally and how has it started in india this is what i'm going to uh, i'll be talking to you on this hello can you please uh, put your mic off somebody in the background yeah Can you see my next slide? Yeah. yeah. See, this is a, just a glimpse of uh, how science museums connect with people with science. This is a photograph taken very recently, just about two years back, when the Nehru Science Center had an exhibition titled Vigyan Samagama. This was an exhibition of uh, mega science where, you know, there is the, the, the government of India and uh, several international uh, um, organizations have uh, invested heavily in this uh, mega science or emerging science uh, uh, subjects and topics which are there for uh, um, uh, they call it youngsters. Um, it included uh, seven mega sciences and what we did is we presented that mega science exhibition at the Nehru Science Center and centering around these uh, seven mega science projects we had uh, lectures every day so that the, the significance of these mega science projects for the common man, particularly for students and general public, can, this can was not be organized. Can you hear me? There is some disturbance coming from your end. Hello? There is some disturbance coming from your end, in fact. My end, is it? Oh. Yeah. Okay, maybe yeah. a fan. I'll just try to put off the fan. Is uh -huh. it bad? Sir, sir, maybe it is because of the headphone. Uh, the it's, it's brushing your shirt, so that's the sound. Oh my God! What about now? Still, 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 you are. I'll put on the fan. Put on the fan. Let's see. Okay, okay. Let's see. That works. Is it better now? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Oh my God! I love to sit in hot now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is aspiration, not inspiration. <laughs> right. Okay. This is just a, a slide which shows how science museums connect with uh, a people. Okay. Hello. Ah, now you are. On. Sir, is it okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, much better. Yeah. Now, there are two kinds of uh, uh, science communication. One is a formal setup of science communication, 
which normally happens at the school and college level, um, that is slightly coercive and a structured way. I use this word uh, coercive with some caution because uh, in India, most of the school learning happens uh, with uh, some kind of a coercion that the child or the students have to appear for an exam and uh, they are evaluated for some marks. So this is a coercive way of formal learning. Then there is a non-formal setup of learning. The non-formal includes uh, a quite a lot of uh, organizations who are involved in this, including the Science Museum. The National Center for Science Communicators who are organizing this and several other uh, um, NGOs and things like that, they all are a part of this uh, non-formal uh, uh, setting. And I had an honor to work in this non-formal setting for about uh, uh, 30 plus years. The genesis of the impetus for the non-formal science uh, communication and particularly the science museum came about uh, post the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution or the, you know, the invention of the steam engine provided a major impetus for uh, a series of uh, technological tools, including what we call as a marvelous tools, which enhance the efficiency of the, of the, the people. Um, I, we know what uh, the role of the industrial revolution has been, particularly in terms of uh, you know automation, mechanized uh, 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 gadgets which came about, uh, which drove the industrial revolution, the cotton industry, for example, cotton mills, the mining, for example. All these things came about uh, um, as a output or as a spin-off benefits of uh, the invention of the steam engine. Then what happened is how do there were several people across the world, particularly in Europe, uh, in London, for example, in England, who were churning out some of the best products which were suiting, uh, which were uh, gelling well with the industrial revolution. And each of these products were um, adding on to the value chain and further efficiency was happening. But then what was happening and how many people were involved? in churning out these products was not known to everyone. So individually, people were all uh, coming out with this uh, wonderful gadgets and tools and uh, machineries, but keeping in mind uh, the artistic elegance of these things. So what they thought is, how do I connect all these things with the people? That is how the, the first industrial revolution, industrial exhibition came about, which is called as the Crystal Palace exhibition. So this was one way of connecting people with the products. You know, I'm not going to gel, I mean, talk about this because uh, there is a gap in the science communication. I think um, Malhotra Saab talked about uh, the gap in the science communication that led to the, the problem that happened in the Kodankulan and several other gaps are there. So let me not talk about this because people have talked on uh, this issue. But then the science communication or communicating what we have achieved is also an important thing. One of the things that uh, we failed as a country is that we were not good documenters. You know, we have a rich legacy of 5,000 plus years of uh, achievement, science and technological achievement. But then since it was not documented, neither the Indians knew nor our colonial rulers knew. Uh, this uh, slide, it shows 1935. Please read it as uh, 1835. We can first understand the significance of the, the weakness of our uh, 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 not documenting what uh, Macaulay, when he introduced the uh, new education uh, system in India, the English education, what he talked about, you know, which I'm sure most of you must have read this. He said a single shelf of a good European library was, uh, you know, it's more than enough to have the whole native literature of India and Arabia. So that is a kind of a, you know, uh, information that was existing in uh, Europe, particularly London, they all felt that countries like India and Arab had nothing to contribute because there was nothing, there was no communication. Uh, and uh, we, we never had uh, publications to connect with people. So this, uh, he used this as a tool to introduce what is called as a modern uh, uh, education, uh, uh, Macaulay's education system, which was introduced, uh, modern education system, which was introduced in 1835. But then what was it that uh, he lost? I mean, he had forgotten or maybe he did not know about it because it was post 1835 that a lot of discoveries, archaeological excavations revealed that Indians had 
lots of contribution to make. Uh, for example, the Mahindra and Harappa, uh, the the Indus Valley Civilization, you know, they were we know that uh, they were good in town planning, dockyards, granaries. It all, I mean, survived uh, from uh, excelled during the period from 2500 to 1800 BC. Much later as well, the post uh, the Harappan period as well. Even uh, during the the, uh, the common era, you know, there were some outstanding contributions like the Delhi Iron Pillar, uh, which has remained restless for 1600 years. That can show about the technological marvel that existed. Then there is another one known as cotton gin. You know, cotton gin has uh, this cotton gin is evidence from the uh, from a painting in uh, in Ajanta, which shows that uh, it is that painting clearly evidences the presence of a cotton gin. The, one should know that a person like Joseph Nidham, who actually documented the science and civilization and produced some marvelous uh, uh, publications, he said that uh, the cotton gin and Indian contribution was responsible for what is called as a industrial revolution. Yet, when we have produced all such wonderful uh, science and technological innovations and discoveries, the Western world was not knowing that um, basically motivated uh, um, Macaulay to make that infamous statement of uh, the Indian's knowledge, uh, which is uh, which could be actually confined to one single uh, shelf of a uh, European like uh, European individual house. So, why this happened? Because we did not have publications. We were not able to connect with people. We were not able to communicate with people, and communication happens both in the formal set setup and in informal setup. So. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the Chinese the, had, uh, the Chinese were able to connect with people because there were uh, such wonderful uh, publications, Science and Civilization, which was uh, produced by a gentleman by name Joseph Nidham. Hello. Can you? So now that communication gap that existed was redeemed when our own colonial British rulers after you know the, uh, co while commemorating the 70 years of Indian independence what they did is they organized an exhibition at the London Science Museum calling it uh, illuminating India 5000 years of science and innovation you can imagine the the uh, the rulers uh, Macaulay who had mentioned that um, the contributions of India can be in me confined to one single uh, almera has now recognized that Indian contribution, um, India has an illuminating science contribution and science and innovation contribution that dates back to 5000 years. In the in the image that you see here, you can see the Baksali manuscript. Baksali manuscript uh, is actually there in the, the Oxford, library, Oxford library now. It shows that uh, the, this is the, the only evidence which documents the symbol for zero, shunya, the decimal place value. And it was in, originally believed that it dates back to about 7th century. But now we know uh, because of the exhibition there. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, 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 please. Okay, okay. Uh, this was clearly showed that it dates back to about 3rd century. So such is the importance of uh, mm, the communication. If there is no communication, people will not understand what your contribution is. Now let us let's come back to the global genesis for, for the science museum. The, I talked to you about uh, the industrial revolution, the invention of the steam engine by James Watt and the explosion of uh, industrial products. Then briefly introduced you about the Crystal Palace exhibition, which is also known as the Great Exhibition, which was held in London in 1851. Subsequently, post the success of, success of the, uh, the, um, the first Crystal Palace exhibition, there were several other exhibitions that followed across the world. Okay? I will briefly talk about that. And also there is another movement which happened in uh, the Royal Society in London, which was actually trying to connect public with science through what is known as the Royal Society Lectures, which was, which was pioneered by, uh, you can see this here. You know, there were two people. One is Michael Faraday and his uh, mm, uh, student, um, uh, my, uh, my, uh, Michael Faraday, and of course his boss uh, Humphrey Davy, who pioneered the public lectures, which were organized at the uh, the Royal Society. They were also 
at the genesis for connecting people with science. So I'm just giving you the historical uh, significance of how even the greatest of scientists, be it Humphrey Davy or Michael Faraday, they used to deliver uh, public lectures to the people. And that too under the ages of the, the Royal Society. Then comes the, the Crystal Palace exhibition of 1851. This Crystal Palace exhibition, I'm giving you a glimpse of the Crystal Palace exhibition here. It was organized from 1st May 1851 to 11th October. Uh, so in fact, about five to six million people visited this exhibition, which you can see here. And one of the pavilion in the exhibition was the India Pavilion in 1851. In fact, most of the, the royal collections that were there in India and also the artistic uh, industrial products, they all went there to be a part of this exhibition. It is only then that people realized that India has so much of a um, wealth and also the industrial product that it can make. One of the um, objects included in the, in the Crystal Palace exhibition was the Kohinoor diamond. So, um, so this, it, Post the exhibition in uh, 11th October, what do we do? There were almost about um, uh, lakhs of objects, uh, uh, products, industrial products and outstanding uh, um, industrial products. Uh, they were all there as a part of this exhibition. What happens to these uh, products? So what they decided is once this exhibition was over, they decided that let these objects be all become a part of the museum. So when anybody goes to London or you, you Google, you will find that there is something known as the Kensington Museums. So there are three major museums that are there in, on this street. One is the Victorian and Albert Museum, the Natural History Museum and the London Science Museum. So all these objects which are a part of the Crystal Palace exhibition were donated permanently or on perpetual loan to these three museums. So these three museums, so the Crystal Palace exhibition became a kind of a genesis or the birthplace from which these museums evolved. The success of the Crystal Palace Museum also resulted in several other uh, exhibitions across the world. One was this uh, industrial exhibition that happened in Paris in 1889. You, you're all seeing the Eiffel Tower there. I mean, you can see this beautiful tower. It was actually built as a gate to the 1889 uh, Paris's World Fair. So, you know, th th such was the importance of this uh, building up of this industrial exhibition so that people across the world come to know about this. Incidentally, Paris also hosted a couple of other exhibitions uh, prior to this, but this was the World uh, Fair exhibition which attracted a lot of people. Uh, when you go to Paris, we also see a lot of museums that have come up and that those museums have uh, succeeded because uh, the industrial products that were displayed during this uh, 1889 exhibition, they became part of uh, uh, the museums. There was one exhibition, unfortunately, there is not much information available to the people, but we must be very, very proud of a Calcutta International Exhibitions that happened in 1883. This exhibition was organized from 4th December 1883 to 10th March 1884. More than 1 million visitors visited this exhibition and the countries who participated in the exhibition included uh, Belgium, Ceylon, France, Ceylon, that now it's Sri Lanka, Germany, Italy, Japan, and Turkey, USA, Australia, New Wales, South Australia, Tasmania. I mean, all these countries, they sent their products for participation in this exhibition. And this exhibition was held just adjacent to the, the Indian Museum. In fact, the Indian Museum hosted a lot of these uh, objects. Interestingly, Although it, it, it attracted about 1 million visitors, uh, there was, uh, um, it could have attracted much more. In 1883, there was something known as the Libert uh, legislation which came up uh, that actually uh, allowed the Indian judiciary to pass judgment on Indian judges to, uh, to pass judgment on the Europeans. So there was a lot of uh, agitation that took place included. So this was not supported by a lot of European uh, people who were there in uh, Calcutta. In spite of that, it became one of the most successful exhibitions. You can see a glimpse of the ex one pavilion of this exhibition. So beautiful it is. You can see the next one. For example, this is the Punjab pavilion. See the kind of a works, artistic, elegant works that uh, the Punjab pavilion hosted. All these products, 
which were there in India were brought to the notice of the world over. In fact, that in incidentally perhaps may have increased the loot that the Britishers uh, took away from India. But yet, you know, this shows the uh, the rich history of the products. A lot of these products became a part of the museum, including the uh, including the Indian museum, and so also uh, the museum in Jaipur, etc. This is another. I would like to specifically show this. This was also a part of the 1883 um, exhibition. You can see this. This is the pavilion which shows showcases the hydroelectric. You can see this uh, beautiful products which came from across the world. Maybe um, people like Dorabji Tata or maybe uh, Jamshedji Tata must have seen this thing. That is the reason he envisaged starting a hydroelectric project in India. And what we see in Kopoli in 19, it was in 1915 that uh, uh, the, the Kopoli electric generator started, Tata hydro Hydroelectric started. And um, I mean, the whole of uh, the Calc uh, Mumbai was supplied by this electricity. So such is the, the wonderful uh, um, impact of an ex world exhibitions that happened, industrial exhibition that happened, including what happened in uh, in Calcutta. Then we go back to this Doshus Museum. The, the Doshus Museum is also a museum uh, which I'm highlighting here because uh, Indian museums were, Indian science museums uh, were influenced by the Doshus Museum. And they also had some wonderful presentation, demonstration. You can see here, action, reaction, kind of, I mean, um, a person who is actually demonstrating to the audience. So a lot of this is followed in India. Since time at hand is very short, I will rush through when the industrial exhibitions were happening, the products of these industrial exhibitions were uh, being transferred to Indian Museum and such other museums, including the Chhatrapati Museum here, which was opened in uh, 1922. There was also an urge for the people to connect with science, connect science with the people. And that happened uh, courtesy Mahindra Lal Sirkal, who and the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. Um, these are the people who were uh, associated with the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, Presidency College, and the Calcutta um, University, who all were actually speaking to the people, connecting with the people, and using the platform of Indian Association of, of Cultivation of Science to talk to the people. These are all veterans. I, uh, each one of them maybe deserve a separate one-time lecture. So I'm not going to talk much about this including C.V. Raman, who, I mean, used the platform of Indian Association of Cultivation of Science to win the Nobel um, Prize in Physics uh, for the discovery uh, of the effect that's known after him, Raman effect in 1928. I will uh, fast forward now and then briefly touch about the significance of these industrial, ex uh, the uh, exhibition that happened, particularly the uh, the industrial exhibition, international industrial exhibition that happened in Calcutta in 1883, and how it benefited Indian Museum, which had commenced from 1814. Then there is one Victorian Albert uh, Museum for Decorative and Industrial Arts. Um, this uh, There was an exhibition uh, in 1855, in the local exhibition, all those products which were a part of this exhibition were put in this museum. This museum is now called as the Bhavdaji Lard Museum. It is there in Bombay. And most of the products uh, that are there were courtesy uh, the exhibition that happened. Um, then there was another industrial art ex uh, museum exhibition in uh, industrial art exhibition in uh, Jaipur, a smaller scale. As a result of that, a lot of museums came up uh, in Jaipur in 1881. There is another Lord Ray Museum, which is now called as the Mahatma Phule Museum, uh, which opened in 1891. That museum is again courtesy in a, a local type of industrial exhibition that happened in Pune. Now I come to the, the, the again, this is the, uh, the Indian Museum. Now I come to the uh, other part of it. Uh, these are the three things which I already talked about, the Victorian and Albert uh, Museum, or the uh, what we call as the Bhavdaji Lord Museum. Uh, the the uh, this we can see the photograph of the Bhavdaji Lard Museum and Mahatma Phule Museum. The first museum to come up uh, in India was the uh, the Birla Museum in Pilani. The Birlas were uh, you know uh, the philanthropic uh, leaders, uh, industrialists who perhaps their ancestors must have seen the industrial exhibition in uh, Calcutta and also had traveled uh, to Europe and other places. They had seen uh, the London Science Museum, the, the Roches Museum. 
so they decided to set up uh, an exhibition uh, a science museum in india based on what they have seen in london science museum and also the the dorchester museum so what they did is they hired a gentleman by name dr charles fabi he was one of the most famous art critic he came from the hungarian uh, uh, origin uh, he was hired uh, to start some kind of a museum um, and what he did is he collected the objects which were like miniature paintings sculpture etc which were in the possession of uh, the L, lakshmi birla uh, he used those things in the meanwhile the trustees visited uh, uh, london and came across the imperial institute of london they saw a lot of uh, the dioramas that were seen uh, in the in the london science museum and other places so what they told is let us buy this uh, uh, the dioramas and bring it back to india so these dioramas were brought back i mean ordered from uh, from london to bring to the uh, the the birla museum unfortunately what happened is uh, due to bad luck when they were being transported uh, these uh, dioramas got damaged so when they again contacted the supplier the cost was exorbitant for repair so this is the turning point for uh, uh, the indians to start making using their what is called as a jugaad to produce some of the best things um, see the one of the birlas actually contacted a gentleman by name dhanraj bhagat most eminent sculptor and a most eminent artist he was associated with school of planning and architecture in uh, um, in delhi he said nothing no, no problem we'll easily solve your problem so he also, uh, attached one of his uh, student by name vp berry so vp berry went to pilani and he repaired all those things and not only repaired those dioramas he started producing outstanding dioramas using the local uh, craftsmen artisans there so thus pilani museum is known for one of the best excellent uh, dioramas which have been replicated in other places this was in 1955 the first science museum actually came up in 1955 and that was by the um, at the pilani museum so i use the name of dhanraj bhagat you know we were fortunate to have uh, an exhibition dedicated to dhanraj bhagat at the national gallery of modern art he is very well known so in a way we should give credit to dhanraj bhagat because it was he who who actually imagined that what can be produced by the 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 people in london can be produced uh, in india itself and that's what they say is history the next museum actually came up in national physical laboratory and curtsy in the case krishnan uh, krishnan identified uh, a gentleman by name um, r subramanian yes please another yes sir another yeah i will i i will sum it up sir um uh, uh, because there are a lot of uh, planetariums in india the most of the planetarium owe their genesis to r subramanian uh, who actually started the planetarium in calcutta why he started that is uh, r subramanian was identified by krishnan to start the science museum in uh, uh, in the in the inside npl campus it became very very popular including there was a small little planetarium which was there unfortunately the popularity of the science museum in uh, uh, science museum inside the npl became its uh, nemesis uh um, the scientists working at the npl uh, they told uh, krishnan and his subsequent uh, directors that it is the public uh, who are coming in large numbers are disturbing the science and that became the end of uh, the uh, the National npl uh, museum it was around this time that uh, in 1959 the first uh, museum came up under csir curtsy again uh, the the birlas it was called as the birla industrial technological museum initially all the museums they were called as industrial and technological museum and this happened courtesy three people one is bc roy the the chief minister of uh, Cal- bengal and uh, pandit nehru and of course gd birla who donated the 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 building of this wonderful building uh, so uh, they used this opportunity to inaugurate uh, uh, the first museum under the national council of science museum which was initially functioning under csir so the birla museum actually became the mother of all science museums which are functioning under ncsm including the nehru science center the next museum that because time is very short i am just rushing through it is a glimpse of the opening of the birla museum in 1959 they have some of the wonderful collections including rabindranath tagore's uh, uh, you know voice these are the collections the next museum came up in under csir in 1965 
uh, the foundation stone of the Vishweshwaraya Museum was laid by Pandit Nehru and it was inaugurated in 1965 by his daughter, uh, Srimati Indira Gandhi. These were again, you know, Vishweshwaraya Industrial Technological Museum. The next to come up was uh, the, Nehru, the Nehru Science Center. Nehru Science Center was also initially called as uh, uh, Mahfatlal Industrial Technological Museum because it was Mahfatlal who gave some 60 uh, acres of land and some 70 lakh rupees. But unfortunately, that did not happen. Uh, in the meantime, what was happening in US was uh, 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 one gentleman by name Frank, o Frank Oppenheimer started uh, an exploratorium where hands-on type of uh, activities was going on. The concept of an industrial museum gave way to science center. That is how the first science center uh, came up under uh, the National Council of Science Museum at uh, uh, the Nehru Science Center. Incidentally, Nehru Science Center, which all of you have seen or will be seeing, um, is the place, first place in the world which actually came up with the concept of a park, open air park. Um, I mean, uh, it, uh, the, the park was opened in 1979. There was a long gap uh, when they were not able to do, do, do this project. Uh, in the interim period, um, the government of India realized that there is no use of putting the science museums under CSIR. Let us start a separate body. So that is how National Council of Science Museum was established. And National Council of Science Museum, subsequent to its formation, started developing science centers at a rapid pace. Now you have about uh, 50 odd science centers across the country, um, which has been developed on turnkey basis by the science centers. Uh, about 20 of them are functioning under the uh, aegis of the National Council of Science Museum. Since time at hand is very short, what I will do is I will keep skipping and go straight to the last but few slides. And yeah, I will go to these slides and show you. Um, so, NCSM is now there across the country. And this is in the Western zone. And in the Western zone, we know we have the, um, there is a science center in Nagpur, in Panji, in Calicut. There's one in Bhopal, Dharampur. And there are several more such centers. You know, these are the science centers which are coming up under NCSM. And also the centers which have been developed by, uh, by NCSM and handed over to the people. Incidentally, Nehru Science Center also has developed uh, uh, what is known as a science innovation activity centers. Four such centers have been developed for the Rajiv Gandhi Science and Technology Commission. Now, these science centers, including about 59 of them, which are spread across the country and SIACs, they are helping in a large way to connect science with people. Uh, I'm sure uh, the scientists and other science communicators will use this opportunity of the science centers and the science and innovation activity centers to connect science with people. Primarily because, you know, there are no, if you are to have applications of science to benefit society, it is integral, it is um, important that we make the people for whom the technology or the applications of science is going to impact be a part of this. More so in the current world of uh, what is called as the fourth industrial revolution, where a lot of ethical issues and the privacy are very important when we are using this technology. So we have to be very transparent in our approach to connect the ethical issues, the transparency uh, and what is called as the privacy issues with the people and take them on board. So this is where uh, the role of science communicators impacts. And you have in the audience engineering students. The, you are the people who are going to transform, use these applications of science into technology. So with these few words, I wish uh, uh, the students there all the very best. May you continue to bring out, churn out some of the best of uh, the applications, wonderful products. Um, machineries which will benefit societies and also the apps, um, you know, the so software apps which India is very famous for. Um, the time at hand was very short, so I was not able to connect uh, all the, uh, the historical aspects of it, but tried my best to show uh, the genesis of uh, uh, science centers in communicating science. Thank you.